Namaste, Carl. Welcome and thank you so much for uh, making time for Ahimsa Conversations. I really appreciate that. Oh, I... My pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I thought we would start with, I think, where we start with all our guests, which is that what would be your earliest recollection of the concept or the practice or, you know, the phenomenon of nonviolence? Going back to your childhood. Oh my, well, it's it's uh, nonviolence is the only way to get things done. I mean, violence just sp spirals into in in and you you don't resolve the situation that way. Um reason sometimes does, uh, emotion sometimes does, but violence won't do it and and as I grew older and began doing confrontations with governments and others, um, clearly violence doesn't work, right? You know, hacking, hacking, throwing, throwing rocks at the window, uh, just doesn't do the job. Um, it doesn't work. I I've given lectures, uh, a lot of young hackers want to, you know, like stick it to the men and change government and do things. And my, my lesson is always uh, that you don't throw rocks at the window. You're just not going to win that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting, you know, that's what uh, Richard Stallman says, no, about why and how he uh, or he started the the licensing and set up the, uh, what did he call it? Um, the Free Software Foundation, right? Wasn't that what it was called? Yeah, that, that's what it's still called. Uh, the, yeah, it's, because it's still, he yeah. said he was tired of just going to uh, protest marches that didn't have a solution. Yeah, yeah, but Free Software Foundation um, actually has some very strong views on what the solution of the world is, and I and I've learned over time that sometimes you can't pound the table and say it's got to be this way. Yeah. Um, you've yeah. got to figure out what the other side is doing, and and particularly in my line of work, which is convincing government to do a better job on making information available um you you need principles you, you you need the line in the sand but you also need to understand what they're doing uh richard and i have not agreed on everything so for example um when i did the first podcasts right mm -hmm. when i was beginning to do radio programming on the internet i put a public domain stamp on it that, mm -hmm. that essentially said you can do anything you want with this i, I don't care it's not mine anymore and Richard sent me a long note and said I should have done a GNU left, which is you can use it, but if you change it, you have to give it back. And um, and I don't. So there are roles for that kind of a you know you can yeah. do it, but here's my rules. Yeah. Uh, there's other times in which you just have to give up and and you simply say here it is. Yeah. Uh, do what you will, and I hope you do the right thing. And and I'm kind of in a camp in which I trust people to do the right thing. I hope they do it, and I know often they won't. Uh, yeah. But I, I'm not going to sit there and and hold their arms. Richard and I have gone back and forth on this quite a few times um, on software as well. Yeah. Uh, we we did the the Bind software. Bind is the domain name system. The 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 software that resolves domain names and I, I chaired the internet systems consortium for a long time right um, i saw that it yeah bind it runs a, a one of the root servers um and richard wanted us to again gnu you know copy left the bind software and we decided not to do that we we did a much more liberal license that essentially said don't sue us do whatever you want um yeah yeah. And, and and I see the the role for the GNU software, but but I'm I'm more in the camp of of hoping to use moral powers to convince people to do the right thing. And when they don't, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure you can stop. So of course. So when you said that about moral force and you know trusting people to do the right thing, uh, that reminded me of your very long, uh, what shall I say? Uh, admiration for and following the story of Gandhi. So how did that happen? How did you uh, discover Gandhi? Oh, I've discovered him a number of ways. So, you know, I, I've been familiar with India for a long time. I traveled here. I wrote a book called Exploring the Internet uh, about the internet in 1991, 1992. So <laughs> I interviewed a guy named Tim Berners-Lee who was in a back office working on a worldwide webby thing. I actually didn't think that was going to work. Uh, so I left it out of the book. Uh, <laughs> you can't win everything. Um, and and I, I came to India and I, I, I wrote about ERNet. 
Um, I did a World's Fair on the internet, and the Dalai Lama wrote the forward to the book, and so I came here. But um, the thing that I've been doing for a very long time is is making information available, and that includes internet standards, um, making sure that they're available so anybody can read the rule book. Um, and in the 90s, I, I started putting big government databases online, uh, the patent database in the U.S., and I've been putting the laws online. And the government is always, isn't always very happy about that. And, and so what I'm doing is questioning authority. And, you know, often they're not happy about it because they don't understand technology's changed and they've always done it this way. But sometimes they get very angry. Uh, and so we're questioning authority. It's not like the liberation of India or, or you know, walking into a temple when when you're a Dalit. Um, but it is trying to influence the way the system works. And and there's some rules yeah. and, and there's a lot to learn. And so I, I, I did a lot of reading with Martin Luther King and our civil rights movement. Um, but, you know, Nelson Mandela, uh, but Gandhi. Is one I, and and there's certain rules like if you're going to go do something you don't hide and do it you tell them um, so if you're going to go make salt uh, in the sea you start by writing a letter to the viceroy that, that says dear friend dear friend uh, I don't have to go make salt you can simply get rid of the silly salt tax and here's my my reasons um, when you win you you should be magnanimous you you don't change the goalposts and say well I won but now we do this. Um, be nice. And, and in fact, Gandhi, um, when he left South be, Africa, he be fair, be, be fair, fair, be fair, and, and, but be magnanimous because you also, want the other side, to be, uh, you, you want them to own it, right? They, they, you yeah. won, yeah. you want them to own it. So like when Gandhi left South Africa, he made sandals for, for general smuts. And and the general wore those sandals. He was very touched. And and in fact, many years later, he sent the sandals back and said, "I'm not fit to walk in these shoes." And and they had a real relationship. And and one of the things I've learned is that when you're trying to get a large government database online, you know, there's a lot of people involved in these things, and they've been doing it this way for 50 years. You want them to own the solution. And, yeah. And that's. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's uh, ahimsa in a way. Um, it yeah. is. It is very powerful yeah. ahimsa, but it's a very difficult to apply, Carl. I really must say that I'm in awe of what you're doing because it is very different to deal with a single person, general smarts. And yeah. as compared to dealing with a, a very amorphous bureaucracy, Oh, and, General Sputz was the head of an amorphous bureaucracy no. that had been... And, and, yeah. and, oh, and yet, and, I know, I know. And yet, uh, I think I could be wrong here. My sense is that what Gandhi was fighting for was something very specific and discreet. It, you know, as you said, it, it, it was a very uh, focused and a very limited, bracketed demand. Oh, but that, that, that's a lesson. That's a lesson is when you fight for something, make it focused and discreet. That, that's yeah. really important. Yeah. That is like, important. You, you, can, yeah. you can do the total general thing, and I admire people that do that. Yeah. But, yeah. but I, I pick specific fights. Yeah, I, but I'm what, what I'm comparing it to is the right to information struggle in India. Right. And I've been following that from uh, its genesis in the villages of Rajasthan in the early 90s. I like Which to was show... a very specific fight. That very Arun specific. Roy yes. went to the villages and, and did the yes. most specific fight you could think of. And yes. it, it was the biggest example of civil resistance since Martin Luther King. Aruna Roy you really think so? wow. did an amazing thing. Amazing, amazing thing. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. I want to show off that I was present at the first public hearing, uh, you know, at which the demand was raised. I feel I, I like to show off about that. It was complete coincidence, but yeah. I I do like to, I, I mean, I feel very privileged to have been present. But yeah. Carl, the way, okay, we got the law, right? And then we are now 20 years down the road from that, from when the law was written into uh, you know, when there's an act is passed and then the law has to be actioned. All that happened. Yeah. And today we find that in very minute and very large ways, 
without closing down the act, I mean, without abolishing the act, the very purpose of right to information is being undermined. You know, that's how and, it works. Oh, I, I was sued by the state of Georgia, accused uh -huh. of terrorism for posting the laws of the state of Georgia. I uh -huh. won in the Supreme Court. And the Chief Justice said that I, I, I shouldn't have economy class access to the law, right? The unannotated informal code of Georgia. I should have the real thing because the people own the law. I still can't get it. Um, the only way to get the official code of Georgia annotated is to subscribe to the Lexus service and you're not allowed to download. And um, and so even though I have a pass to the first class lounge from the Chief Justice of the United States, I didn't win. And we have another five years ahead of us. Um, um, Thurgood Marshall saw that. He won Brown versus Board of Education. But, you know, it took another 20 years to begin to really desegregate the, the schools. And you know what? He never won. Um, we still have huge issues in the United States of yeah. inequality in our schools and inequality in our libraries and uh, inequality. And, and so you win, um, but you got to you got to keep struggle up. Uh, Martin Luther King says that, that change does not come rolling in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes only with continuous struggle. And and I th I think this is not a you know, like a thing that happens and then you go home and have pizza. Um, no, no, I, I, I no. think you just have to have the values and and, yeah. and keep, just, yeah. just keep working. Yeah. yeah. So the way I see it working around me and a lot of my friends and colleagues, uh, as you can understand, currently are very dis despondent. Okay. There's a lot of despair around us at the moment. Uh, I'm sure it's worse in the US in some ways. Uh, but how do you do this? What you just said, how do you keep the effort on? And I think the first thing that is required there is not to allow cynicism to capture your mind. How, how what is your secret? How are you doing it? Well, you just have to keep on going. Uh, so, you know, um, in uh, in the open government sector, hackathons got real popular in which, you know, you show up for a weekend and you, you, you have a solution to something and then you have pizza. Um, and, and that's not the way you do it. And I think any serious fight takes a decade or more. Yeah. Um, and, and I look at the stuff I've done and, you know, occasionally you get lucky and you get it done in a couple of years. Uh, but usually it takes a decade or longer. We we have been making, um, we're trying to make building and electrical and fire codes, right? Which are the law. They're very technical laws. Yeah. They're the law, but they cost money um, and they have copyright. And, and that's just the way it is all over the world. And we, we launched a fight to make the building codes and electrical codes of America available. It took 10 years of litigation. We won. We won. U.S. Court of Appeals said it was fair use to make the law available. Um, but we got another five years ahead of us on that. In India, we won too. We we put all the Indian standards online mm -hmm. and the Bureau of Indian Standards was not very happy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I talked to a member of the government uh, who is a cabinet minister about it and said, you know, these are standards and they have the force of law and they're crucial to public safety. Um, and I'm going to put them online. He said, this is good. You should do it. Um, and I said, you know, the bureau is going to be pretty pissed off. Um, but um, it took seven years in the courts and, and the Bureau of Indian Standards started making all their standards available for free. You know, like for you can download them and you can read them. And, um, and so that, that's a win. Uh, they, they didn't say we had anything to do with that. They just started yeah. doing it. Um, and, and that's another lesson, by the way, is when when you win, sometimes you don't get credit, but it doesn't matter because, you know, it's it's what you wanted. So, yeah, uh, it, it's I, I think you have to believe in the fundamental values and, and then you have to um, see what happens and just keep plugging away. And, and you just have yeah. to, like, understand that, that sometimes it takes time. So, Carl, for the benefit of those watching who would not know your background and your work. Can you spell out those fundamental values which have brought you here and which keep you going? Oh, I'm not sure I know what those fundamental values are, but I, I so I, I you know, I, I began um, 
I, I was trained as an economist and I dropped out of my PhD program because, you know, computers were starting to happen like 1982. And I, I wrote a lot of professional reference books about computer networks. I did a three volume series, um, got involved in the Internet Engineering Task Force. And, and so for me, it's it's partly fundamental values, but it's par partly experience. Um, so in writing those books, I needed the the standards that, that govern telephone networks, because that, that's what the Internet was built on in those days. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it turns out it's gotten flipped over and the telephone network is now built on the Internet. Uh, but what I discovered is that many of those standards cost a lot of money. And it didn't make any sense to me that they not only did they cost a lot of money and you couldn't read them. And, you know, same thing with scientific information. Right. If, if you're a scientist, you need journal articles and those cost a lot of money. Uh, but for me, it was Internet standards. And that to me just seemed wrong. And so I, I, I did a number of strategic interventions to make standards available. Mm -hmm. um, but I also was involved in the Internet Engineering Task Force and our Internet has standards available for free, right? There, there's no restrictions on their use. There were two internets in the late 1980s. There was one called the Open Systems Interconnection and it was Department of Defense in the US and the telephone companies and the European Commission. And they put hundreds of millions of dollars into this internet. And it was very complicated standards and they cost thousands of dollars and, and our internet won. And so it's life experience that you make it open and available. Yeah. Um, I, I invented podcasting, right? I, I did the first uh, podcasts on um, uh, 1993. I, I started a program called Geek of the Week. Um, uh, it was the fir first internet radio station. And, you know, three years later, someone came along and got a patent on podcasting. And we were able to beat it back because there was prior art at the time but but yeah. it's the open that yeah. wins and yeah. tim Berners lee could have patented the world wide web and you yeah. know he's been asked many times why didn't you do that yeah. because like i said it worked it, it would not have worked yeah. um you know certain yeah. things only work if you give it away um That's and right. you're, you're not you're not an owner of property and knowledge. You're, you're a trustee. And that, that's a Gandhi principle, right? Gandhi said, you don't own wealth, you're a trustee. And yeah. I think the same applies to knowledge. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think these are fundamental to uh, nonviolence in the economic sphere as a whole, or rather, the if you look at it in a larger frame, the entire public sphere. So could you say more about how the commons in all their many forms, are a kind of potential antidote to the structural violence, which otherwise seems dominant in our world. Well, that's one of the things that's happened over time is our commons has been enclosed. And knowledge, scientific knowledge is a great example. Journal articles yeah. um, are owned by Reed Elsevier and the American Chemical Society. And it's been a huge issue of, about the, the advance of science. When I give talks in India, and I'm, I'm at an institute of science or an IIT, and I say, how many of you use Sci-Hub, right? The pirate site that has all the journals. And every hand goes up, including the vice chancellor. Um, because you cannot access scientific information um, without going to those paywalls and paying a huge amount of money. And what's interesting is that, that the users of Sci-Hub, the, the site that has all the journal articles, the top 10 users include not only like China, India, Kingdom, because students even at Harvard do not have access to the scientific knowledge they need in order to to complete their education and and to and and to do their research and and I think universal access to knowledge is not only the great promise of our of our times, yeah. um, but it's a fundamental human right. And yeah. and and when you see the the access to knowledge has been cordoned off and privatized. Um, it's it's a huge, huge issue, and it, it's something we have to fight for. And it's a fundamental issue, right? Because you can't, if, if you don't have access to knowledge, you don't have access to economic opportunity. You can't, um, in, in the Indian constitution, you can practice the profession of your choice, but but if you can't learn about your profession, how can you practice it? Um, I mean, how can you acquire even the skills to practice it? Well, not only that, a democracy is based on informed 
uh, electorate. And, and Ambedkar was, was very clear about that. You could have government for the people, you could make the trains run fast, um, or government by the people in which the people decide what the fundamental rights are. And, and that all depends on education and access to knowledge. So that, that's a that's a fundamental. And, and the, the basic truth upon which the open source movement and the whole activism on commons, I think, has built is that knowledge is that one thing which defies the law of scarcity. You see, if I give you this pen, then I no longer have it. But yeah, that's not yeah. so with knowledge. I will still know what I know after I have shared it with you. Well, not only that, intellectual property is not an absolute thing. It's not a binary, right? It, it's like, it, uh, and so there are people, and they typically those people are corporations, uh, large publishers uh, that say, uh, copyright is a binary thing. I own the intellectual property. Any use you want of this must be asked for. But copyright is not that. It's a balance. Um, and, and there's all sorts of rights that we have to knowledge and, yeah. and shouldn't have to ask for, right? And it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a, gee, I want to do this. May I have permission? It's I'm going to use this knowledge and, and, and it's okay to do that. Um, In fact, without but, that, knowledge doesn't grow. Oh no! Uh, the advancement of science, the uh, promotion, the the increase and in diffusion of knowledge is 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 a phrase from the eighteen hundreds. Uh, yeah. It does not happen unless people have access. Not only that, knowledge increases from random places, right? So it it, it isn't just if you're a student at Harvard, you can contribute to the 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 increase in diffusion of knowledge it's it's we learned that on the internet and with the internet standards our, ours were open but you know when the internet first happened there was a protocol called tcp ip it's a fundamental uh transmission control protocol internet protocol it's it's the basic you know like data gets sent to the other side when vince surf and bob Kahn came up with the tcp ip protocol it didn't work it didn't work because the way the, the way it works is is you you send a packet out into the internet to the other side, um, but the internet is built on the idea of you send it out and it's a best effort thing. So maybe it doesn't get there, and and that's the internet protocol. You you send data out, it goes. TCP builds on top of that and it says, I sent you data. I'm going to send you more data. So here's packet one, here's packet two, here's packet three, and you wait a while and maybe the internet protocol didn't deliver it, right? And 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 so you, you get a note back saying, I didn't get packet two. So you send packet two again. And, and the way TCP IP was originally sent is you didn't get the packet, you, you sent, I didn't get it, you send it again, and then you send it again. And maybe the network isn't working right now. And so you you keep saying, well, I didn't get an acknowledgement. I sent it again. I said, so you're making it worse, right? The, the internet's congested and you're oh. sending all this stuff in, right? Over and over and you're making it worse and worse. And, and this random guy out at Lawrence Berkeley Lab said, wait a minute, there's a 12 line patch to the internet that'll make it better. And the way that works is, is you send your packet and you wait 30 seconds. And if you don't get an acknowledgement, you send it again. If you don't get acknowledgement, you wait a minute. It's called the back off algorithm. If it doesn't happen, you wait two minutes. If it doesn't happen, you wait four minutes. So rather than contributing con congestion, you are backing off and letting the congestion go away. And when that 12 line patch got de de deployed, the internet started to work. Um, and again, it was a random guy out there. It's because the standards were open. Um, and there's been numerous examples of that, of, of we put the code out there for the World Wide Web and something's wrong with it. And some guy in Japan comes out um, or, you know, somebody in Australia. Um, and that's why the Internet works today is because the standards were open and the code was open. And open source and open knowledge are a way of allowing that random person. And there's numerous examples out of India of yeah. people teaching themselves mathematics and coming up with solutions to arcane problems that you know the people in the Royal Society had not been able to do. And and that you need that, or knowledge does not not flourish. And and sometimes the corporations don't believe that. They think they own it and they can control it. And and that that never is a good result. So true, so true. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee frequently laments 
that the World Wide Web has been kind of, well, sometimes he says hijacked, sometimes I've heard the word cannibalized by the very beings that exist uh, because of the World Wide Web. And um, how much of this angst do you share and where are we headed? I, you know, I think it's always been hijacked and <laughs> that angst has always been there. Uh, I get what he's saying. I, I totally get, it. you know, so the, the, the internet is supposed to be a distributed, right? You know, every, Meaning every the dream, every, the dream uh, that he, with which I think all of you were, are in a sense, the originators of that dream that yeah. here is something that is going to put us in another level, you know, which is like the Gutenberg press uh, times a million of opportunity and expansion and flowering of human potential rather it than control. Done it rather has done that. It, it's totally done that. And we still have, you know, Facebooks and, and you know, big centers. So what's happened is, is the idea that everybody runs their own server. Um, you know, it's all kind of migrated into these large, you know, cloud systems. But you still have the innovation. It's still an end-to-end -end network. Um, there's still hope uh, you can still do distributed network. I mean, so our effort is to build a distributed public library of India in which everybody can scan books, everyone can serve books, and it isn't some big top down, you know, government like, you know, ordained system. And you can have that too. It's okay to have this big centralized system, but you also want the bottom up grassroots things to happen. And I still think that opportunity is there. Uh, you just can't give up faith, right? No, you, of course you gotta not. Like, have your no, values and keep going. Change yeah. takes time. It really does. I, I mean, look yeah. at the civil rights movement in yeah. the U.S., how long that took from, from the civil war I mean, to the It's still going on. It's still today, going. Right? Absolutely. It's still going on. And things have gotten better and things have gotten worse. But you, you have to just, just keep on plugging away. Yeah. And, so we yeah. should not again, take it. My advice is pick, mm -hmm. pick a couple of bites, right? mm -hmm. a couple specific things. And that's what you do. And, yeah. and you just got to keep plugging away at it. It's, it's going to take a long time. So what do you say to Tim when he's lamenting? Oh, I, so I know Tim pretty well. I'm um, sure you do. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. Um, it's like, well, keep plugging away. I, I mean, you know, just, just uh, lament. I mean, that's good to speak up. and Yeah, you know, because he's different. heard. He's taken seriously. Absolutely. And and you have to communicate. You you have to stand up and speak and explain the fundamental values. But at the end of the day, um, you need to keep working with the young people that are coming in saying, I want to do something. It's like, go, you know, go do it. Um, it's good. Uh, pick something. Uh, so what, what, what is not good is standing up and having a solution to all our problems. With, and, you know, people do that. They stand up and they, they say that this is the solution. We got to do this. We got to do that. Um, and to me, you pick a specific thing. Yeah. that you're doing. And for me, it's the law in public libraries. And, and I, I look for specific interventions I can do that might make a difference. And what I do is I look for examples of people going like totally over the edge. So I, I look for a government database in which, you know, everyone looks at it and says, building codes, force of law, mandatory fire exits. Wait a minute, they're copyright. I'm not able to use them. They cost a thousand dollars. That's nuts. So I, I look for issues in which I can explain it to a member of Congress or cabinet minister in one minute. And they go, wait a minute, that's totally ridiculous. And, and then there's a big, long explanation as to why it's that way, right? Public-private partnership and this and that, and there's no free lunch. But but the core message is, wait a minute, it costs you know $1,000 to buy the building code of California, and you're not allowed to copy it. And any judge and any any member of Congress, any county commissioner looks at that and says, wait a minute, really? <laughs> that, that can't be right. And, and that's the issues I pick. I, 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 so like the issue of building codes, we, mm -hmm. which has had huge opposition. We had 10 years of litigation in the U.S. for making the building codes and fire codes available. I, I, I can not only explain it to a member of Congress in one minute. If I sit down in a bar and they go, so what are you doing? Oh, I make the, the plumbing code of California available for free. Guy next to me invariably is going to be a plumber. It buys me a beer. He just goes, wait a minute, that, that's so good. I, I, you know, you can explain this in one minute to, to somebody. And, and that's the yeah. issues that I look yeah. for is people 
going over the edge. It's what Gandhi did with salt. You know, it's like salt. Really? It's taxed? Are, are you out of your mind? Um, you know, it, people yeah. can't afford salt. Uh, yeah. That That's just so ridiculous that everybody understands it. And I think that's one of the keys to civil resistance is you look for an issue in which the other side has really jumped the fence. Um, and when they, it doesn't mean you're going to win. No, but it means you can at least explain what you're doing um, in a way that makes some sense. Yes, yeah. and what I'm hearing from you here is the importance of a dialogic approach, the willingness to be able to listen to the other person, and yeah. then engage on that basis. Absolutely, um, you you and and you know one of the reasons things are so screwed up is because that's the way they've always done it. You know, and 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 it isn't that they're evil. It isn't, you know, uh, you know, maybe they're 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 just not thinking. But if they've always done it that way, and and with the internet, we have new tools available, new ways of doing things, and yeah. and and you just have to like go to people and say, look, you know, it can be different. One of the, our big things is is showing by doing, because often, you know, you, if if you just go to someone and say that, that government data should be available, it's like, well, son. You don't understand. Government is difficult. It costs money. We have procedures. But often that data is available for sale. And if you buy it and you make it available, and then you go back to that cabinet minister and say, you know, I'm getting a million hits a day on this thing, and it costs me $100,000 to buy all the data and serve it. They'll look at that and go, wait a minute, why aren't we doing this? Uh, that's what I had with the U.S. patent database. Uh, they, they were selling patents for forty million dollars a year. Was was what the revenue was on the, on the, the the patent office. Uh, I I bought the patents. I, I bought the wholesale feed. I served them online. And Vice President Gore called in the commissioner of patents. And said, Why the hell can't you make them available for free like Carl does? And the commissioner was like, I make forty million dollars a year selling them. Uh, but How if you order you? me. You know, if you order me to do this, I'll do it. But he got all red in the face and started shouting at the vice president. I, I wasn't at that meeting, but I heard about it. You know, in the White House, you don't shout at the vice president. That That's just not. But but he got all pissed off and red in the face and was like, if you order me to do this and I'll do it. Uh, but he had an untenable position because yeah. a patent database, right, is, is, is one of the few databases specifically called out in the U.S. Constitution, right? It's actually mentioned in the U.S. Constitution as, as something that needs to be available to the public. And so he didn't have a very good position on that one. Um, but, but again, if you do it, it's very different than simply writing a white paper and saying you should make this available. You, you put it online. And you get millions of hits a day and you get people adding value and using it. And, 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 you know, the government people, you know, at the end of the day, the ministers especially are there because they want to do what people like. And, and if they see that people like it, then, yeah. then you got a shot at getting them to, to change the bureaucracy. Yeah, but there is also a conflict between what people like and the vested interest of a few who have big bucks to make by doing the opposite. It's a lot of money, like in the U.S. and serving the law, right? There, there's a couple of companies like Lexus and West that have yeah. exclusive rights to sell the laws of several of our states. And they, yeah. they are not yeah. going peacefully on, on this fight. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're, how are you dealing with power. that? How, do you, how well, do you deal with that power? Well, um, so in my small nonprofit in the U.S., public resource, right. um, we don't have a lot of money. We're, we're about a you know a half a million to a million dollar a year operation, but our lawyers all work for free. Uh, we have 10 law firms work for free. Uh, we have other law firms do friend of the courts brief. Uh, we have law clinics that, that do work for us. So I, I I don't pay my law firms, but I ask them at the end of the year for what's called a pro forma invoice. How much would this have cost? And my my pro forma invoice each year is over a million dollars and has been for the last 10 years. And so the lawyers of America, not all of them, but but a, a large number of them have stood up and 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 helped us, you know, fight this issue of is the law copyright or not. And then we've had the Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, Colorado clinics, uh, amazing students, right? These are people that are, you know, you know, they're getting their law degrees, but they're they're really bright. Um, they have done like yeoman's work for us. So when we were in front of the Court of Appeals on should building codes be available, um, New York University got the NAACP 
to sign on as a client for a friend of the court brief. Uh, another university got the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors to do one. Another one got the labor union of, of, of employees of, of the government. Um, and they all did friend of the court briefs and supported our work. And that opened the eyes of the judges. And, and it's one way that we were able to kind of, you know, win on that one. Uh, again, we got a court opinion, but that doesn't mean that we're done. No, of course uh, right? not. The fight has to go on. Sure. But it was uh, a great opinion. It's a great opinion. I mean, it said the law must be available. So yeah, yeah. no, know. so it's a it's a big landmark, and then you build upon that. Yeah, yeah, yes. Is capitalism a big issue in this whole struggle for protecting and nurturing the commons, or is there something much larger and more historic that we are up against? So I was really impressed with Rohini Nilakani's book, um, right? Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar. I think they all have their roles. And, and I think our, our world has tilted very much in into the the bazaar, um, the, the the capitalist solution. And, and so what we get, like when the state of Georgia said we, we have to have a copyright over the law and give Lexus Nexus the exclusive right to sell the official code of Georgia annotated, um, that, that that was a shift way too far into bazaar. Um, there's other times when you look at building a public library of India, and the question is, is that a role for government, right? Is, is that a Sarkar thing? And, and I believe there's a role for the government in building national institutions and doing things. But I also believe that Samaj and open source and whatever you want to call it has a huge role to play. And, and I think it's very important that we fight for that third part. Uh, there's a huge role for our system of capitalism. I, I think that that if someone writes a, a novel, they should be able to profit from that novel. On the other hand, if, if the government is funding your research and you write an article about it in a journal, that needs to be available to everybody. I, I, I think the balance has shifted um, too much. Um, so it's not an anti-capitalism thing so much. Um, and same thing with the internet. I, I, I think Google does amazing stuff. Um, Facebook, I, I'm not as big a fan, but uh, they're arguably an important contributor. I, Amazon is out there. Apple, I, I use Apple computers all the time. But I also use, you know, fundamental, like, you know, like for disk, I, I use what's called JBOD, just a bunch of disks. And, and you know, kind of raw iron and Unix systems and and things like that. You need both. Yeah, You need both there. And I think there's a role for like the latest iPhone, but then there ought to be an open source, you know, Android phone available that, that isn't necessarily one that Google sells you. Yeah. Um, which I, is, I you which is happening. That is what it is at the moment anyway. You have it's all still, the options. You need a balance. And, and I think the balance shifted and I think it shifted too much towards large government systems as, as the solution and too much towards the market will solve all. And I think there's a huge role for, for what's often called civil society, but civil society has to be, be, be roll up your sleeves, hardcore, you know, operational tech um, to solve some of these problems. So if you're going to fight LexisNexis and West uh, making the law available, you, you need to be able to operate at, at their level. And one of the things we do when we make, uh, so I work very closely with Sushant Sinha, who does Indian Canoe, which makes all the court cases of India available. I've worked with him for 11 years. He's a key player in the work I do. Um, he operates at what's called an enterprise scale, right? He is doing computers at the same level that the Google people do and the Facebook people do. Uh, same thing with our library efforts. We, we are running enterprise grade security, um, you know, real disk, uh, real performance stuff. We're not as big as they are, but, but we're doing the same. And I think civil society needs to pick up the tech skills to be able to operate if, if we're going to compete with with the government and, and the market um, mm -hmm. to provide solutions that, that have a focus that, that is for the public and for the commons. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to operate at that level. And, and we are. If you look at the open source world, in fact, a lot of corporations run on open source. Yes, um, but actually. If, 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 
Oh, oh, totally, totally. And if you look at the open source world, it is very sophisticated, uh, very technically capable, um, does cybersecurity. And, you know, look at Signal, which is a communications app. Um, it's as good as you get uh, when you're doing this stuff. Uh, you know, there's WhatsApp, but, you know, WhatsApp is built on a Signal like code base yeah. in, in many ways. So yeah. um, we yeah. need to do that. And and that's one of the things that when I work with, with uh, particularly young people working in NGOs, many of them have the tech skills. And, and the trick is we need to give them the same training and the same support that you would get if you were a young engineer at Google, right? When you go there, they train you, they teach you, they bring you up to that next level. We need to do the same thing in civil society. Wonderful. Well, some people have been trying, but I'm afraid that maybe the resources at their command, both financial resources and time and energy resources are not comparable with the- It's really hard to run an operational NGO. I, I've been doing this for 30 years. Remember? So my internet radio station could have been commercial, right? It, it would have been easily gotten dot-com money, but I, I, it was a public radio station. I, yeah. I ran it as, as an NGO. It yeah. was really hard raising money. And yeah. I, I talk all the time to young people that are like building, you know, free law services and this and that. And they're like, how do I get money? And, you know, they're like, you know, do you know anybody at Rockefeller or Ford? Or And it's like, you're probably not going to get money from them. Um, there are certain people that do fund things. Uh, I'm funded by the Arcadia uh, Fund in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, they're amazing. They put a billion dollars over the last 10 years into open science um, they funded me. They funded all sorts of people. There, there's people in India. Uh, again, Rohini Nilakani um, has made some amazing investments at scale um, yeah. into NGOs to build them up and, and give them the resources they need. It's still hard. If uh, You know, it's yeah. just as hard to run a dot com, though, if, if you're running a business, <laughs> you're trying true. to get venture capital. and. Uh, yeah, I, it's yeah, easy yeah. to do a build and flip, right? You you have the latest AI, this or that, and you yeah you, you build it up to thirty people and you sell it to somebody else. But if you're really trying to do something real, like if yeah. you're trying to like solve medical delivery using AI, it's really hard to do it either commercially or non commercially. Um, you got to really want to do it, and and you got to put everything you got into it. Um, you, you can't just be like sitting back, uh, you know, sometimes you're lucky and your uncle's got a lot of money and you get investment, but usually those things don't work. <laughs> usually the people that, that win are, are the ones that, that really wanted to do it and, and put everything they had into it. And, and, and it usually isn't a one year, I got the money I sold to Google. Usually yeah. it's a 10 year crawl to build something real. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so a, gotta keep a lot of the young people I know, uh, you know, under 35 age group are very excited now about distributed networks and the potential of blockchain technology. Yeah, and I would say look is, at something else. <laughs> what's your feeling about that? Oh, blockchain is, is I, I, you know, it's not the answer. It, it, it's, uh, so I, I get the distributed technology. Blockchain is a, particularly Bitcoin is, is a proof of work thing. It's, it's like, you know, if you get lucky, you get your Bitcoin and it's worth money. It's a speculative um, thing. Um, and and I, I've seen so many people coming in. So it used to be everything was a blockchain solution. Like I'm going to do land records, right, you know, for the government and I'm going to do a blockchain based system. Uh, now it's all AI, right? A, a, everything's like, I'm going to do a, a generative AI solution. Um, th those are gimmicks and trends. And, and so there's a lot in AI um, mm -hmm. to do. I, I don't think the chat GPT way of, of ask me anything and I'll tell you like, you know, a bunch of lies. Um, but it, some of it's truth and some of it isn't. Um, but, you know, if you're asking a question on something and what you're getting back is maybe real and usually not, um, I'm not sure how useful that is. On the other hand, there's a lot you can do with the fundamental things, large learning models, generative AI. So we use it for optical music recognition. So the, you, you scan sheet music, uh, folk songs, John Philip Sousa, you turn it into music XML, you, you turn it into wave files. Uh, Sushant Sinha, Indian Canoon, uses it to analyze court cases to figure out what parts are the facts 
you know, what parts of the opinion. Uh, th there's a lot there, uh, but I'm not sure the the chat interface thing is is necessarily where I would be. Um, I'm maybe in the minority on this, mm -hmm. um, but 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 I I I think it, it's gotten hyped up, and I, I've seen technology do that in ways, right? You know, it was relational databases and it was artificial intelligence, natural language processing. Um, and, and there's been these waves and the things that have survived are the ones that like solve real problems and, and kind of focus in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if I had a PowerPoint presentation, I could go to Sand Hill Road in, in Silicon Valley and, you know, I'd have a hundred million dollars in my pocket in, in, in one hour because it, it's the, the thing that's happening right now. And, and every time I talk to people that are doing legal work, for example, in India, it's always, <laughs> what about AI? Um, but but I, I think technology is more fundamental than that. And it's not, are you using AI? It's what problem are you trying to solve, right? I, that, that's the important thing. Yeah. And maybe you're using AI to solve it. But but the important thing is I'm trying to solve a problem. I, I'm trying to figure out how to get uh, people having access to justice issues on family law to be able to, to like solve their problems more efficiently. I, I'm trying to get people that are in the field doing medical delivery to get information they need. And if that's a problem you're solving, you're going to use whatever tools you can. And, you know, AI is one of them. Um, but, but it isn't, you know, it isn't like the, the technology by itself doesn't matter if you're not trying to solve a real world problem. Absolutely. Yeah. You are also involved in some work related to the Gandhi Museum or the Gandhi Bhavan in Bangalore. What oh, we have a home at Gandhi Bhavan. They, they gave us this beautiful, like, huge room. Uh, we scanned the entire Gandhi Bhavan library. Uh -huh. um, I a huge collection called Hinswaraj, which was not only collected works of Gandhi and Nehru and Ambedkar and Radhakrishnan, but it was the Desai diaries and something I built up over time. Uh, Gandhi Bhavan gave us room, uh -huh. um, partly because of our Gandhian philosophy, but 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 you know, we're, we we scanned their library. In fact, just today we had visitors from the Gandhi Bhavans um, in in Chennai and and um, you know in in uh, a group from Hyderabad and a group from Kochi. And we offered it to them. It's like if if you have things in Tamil or or, or in Telugu or or in Malayalam, uh, we'll scan them for you and and put them online. Um, and and so we're 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 working with the Gandhi Bhavans. We work with the National Law School of India University. We scanned their entire library. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of Canada stuff. Uh, Canada University Hampi and the BM Sri Library. Mm. And we're working with, we're, we're hoping to work very soon with uh, rural libraries in Karnataka to, wow. to make to make children's books and Gandhi literature and stuff available to 6,000 rural libraries uh, yeah. throughout Karnataka. And, and to make. So you must be familiar with Story Weaver because that's another very big effort of this kind. Story well, that's Weaver. Parvish, who does amazing. This is one of the best programmers you can you can find. Uh, does amazing, amazing work. Um, and yeah. you know, there's a lot of that in India. Um, there, there's all sorts of pockets of people doing things. Um, we work with um, uh, T. Srinivasan in, in um, Chennai. He's actually in Toronto right now, but he's put thousands of Tamil books online and helped us at the Roja Muthai Library do doing tech support. Um, we have friends in, in Mangalore that do things. Uh, there's a whole group of people in Mumbai doing amazing work on, on film, uh, mm -hmm. the Padma system. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's this kind of this gestation and revolution throughout mm -hmm. India. Same thing in the US and in the UK, but in India, it's, it's particularly important because, you know, the, the, the Western operations, Google Books and Hathi Trust and British Museum, so they do all the German and the French and the English and, and they scan all that stuff and they make it available. But but the, the treasures throughout India are, are, are just huge. They're vast. Um, and making that available is, is something that, that we have to do in, in India. In, in India. Yeah. Um, and that's something we're trying to do is, is to take our technology to scan and push it out into all the different museums and libraries and yeah. organizations in India. So it's a bottom up grassroots uh, oh, public yeah. library. But it does take people to do this. So how are you funding it? 
Uh, so um, it, it's funded by volunteers and by contractors and by people. And, and you know, it's it's so we're we're doing 15 lock pages uh, a month now, wow. um, which is wow. bad um, uh, in Gandhi Bhavan. Um, <laughs> and, and we've been doing this for quite a while. So our first home was the Indian Academy of Sciences. They, they gave right. us room in their basement to scan. Uh, Roja Muthaya, you know, let us put scanners there. Uh, Vishwa Kunkani in Mangalore. Uh, national law school and and we've just been slowly growing it up um and, as an effort and and you know funding it is 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 hard but we think the money is there in india to build up a, a real library of india and and That's we're hoping it. that for you know over the next few years uh, that that happens it, it's yeah. I, it seems to be well on its way so in closing carl what advice would you give to young people uh, because we live in a time of paradox there is a great deal that, you know, makes you very excited and hopeful. And at the same time, there is so much happening around us, uh, which can induce despair. Uh, and in your, you know, since you're part of, in a sense, the revolution that gave us the whole world that we live in now, including the World Wide Web, um, uh, there was a time when people said that maybe this is the new sphere. You know, the idea that uh, Teilhard de Chardin had proposed that just as there is a biosphere, the thoughts and vibrations that humans generate are also like a sphere. That Well, um, I, I, every and, generation... And so is this, are we headed in that direction? I mean, are you positive about the future? Every generation has an opportunity. So, you know, in the 60s, maybe you were working on computers. Um, in uh, the 40s, maybe, or in the 1890s, maybe you were working on industrial automation. Um, and, and so the, the advice is twofold. One is, is learn about the world around you. Learn, learn widely, like learn. Uh, don't, don't just, you know, like do WhatsApp groups and stuff, but, you know, sit down. And if you're interested in networking, read the internet standards, right? They're, they're all available. And, and that's how I began is I actually read every internet RSC and then I wrote a book about them. Um, so, so read widely. But the big advice is pick one thing and focus on it for 10 years. And I, I don't care what it is. Adopt your local NGO and you're you're doing school lunches for people. Um, you know, maybe you're scanning books. Maybe you're doing the ultimate Canada fonts that do OCR better. Maybe, you know, pick something and focus on it for 10 years. Become the world's leading expert on that issue. Do it over and over and over again. And, and then eventually you're going to win, right? You're, you're going to come up with a solution to things. You, you will have understood the problem well enough and you understand the world around you well enough that you can come up with something that, that actually makes a difference in your world. And you can do that. And, and people need to to focus in. And that, that's always my advice. Don't don't throw rocks at the window. If something's wrong and you don't like it, learn about it. Learn about it really hard. Learn everything there is to know about what they do. And yeah. then come up with a better solution. And maybe you're going to have to learn something yourself before you can do that solution. But but learn. Knowledge yeah. Is, yeah. is the key. But the what I'm also... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But what I'm also seeing in you, Carl, is a wonderful combination of patience and impatience that you need yeah. both yeah you have to figure out when to actually like act and and so you know sometimes i've done things that maybe the lawyers wouldn't have wanted like you know for example when i started doing building codes people said well just put one building code online and see if anybody's upset and i didn't do that i i put 1000 <laughs> codes on the internet um, all of them had the force of law and it it forced the issue it it made it real um, and if I'd done just one, it would have been a theoretical, you know, who knows, sue me, I, I want to fight. Um, but I didn't want to fight. I just wanted to make the codes available. And so I, I put them all online. So sometimes you have to take a risk, but you should learn about it first. Uh, before I did that, I read every court opinion there had to, you know, that was out there about like, you know, was the law available and what about building codes? And, and then I thought about it really hard for a couple of years. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm ready. Um, and, and I think that that's the whole do something for 10 years thing, because if you've done it and you've thought about it, you've learned about it, when it comes time to act, you, you know the answer.
and yeah. and that that's something you get out of out of reading you know gandhi uh but it's something you get out of reading hindu scriptures it's something you get out of reading about people that have made a difference in the world they they thought about it they thought about it really hard they taught themselves and they said okay my time is now it's time to go and maybe you win and maybe you don't um but but at least you tried very cool wonderful Thank you so much. It's really an honor to meet you, Carl. It's such a pleasure, Raj.